defendants and third party defendants uh, refused to offer any um, uh, lump sum to get my client uh, released from the guarantee. Um, what would your attorney's fee be at the present, David? Your Honor, I haven't looked at it, but they're probably, you know, approaching around the $50,000 mark. Um, I, I will say to you, Your Honor, I feel like I'm, I'm doing the work of two attorneys. Um, and the reason I say that is because, um, like I said before, uh, I have gone to the, you know, um, 10th degree to try to get this thing resolved. Um, we have located third-party lenders for the defendants and third-party defendants to apply for credit with to try to get my client released. Um, of those four third-party lenders that I identified, to my knowledge, the defendants and third-party, actually, the defendants only apply to one of them. Um, so before, and, before you get into the details, Dave, Dave, relax for just a moment. Um, so today, as we speak, in the claim that you have right now, and for the record, Deb, I can see my my uh, my my courtroom, uh, which is kind of nice. So, uh, the uh, your claim right now is for breach of contract, correct? And and all that's associated, you know, the bad faith, all that kind of stuff that goes along with those cases. And and your damages would be fifty thousand plus attorney's fees, correct? Yeah, attorney's fees, costs, and expenses, correct, Your Honor. In the new causes of action you are attempting to assert, there's no change in damages and no change in attorney's fees, correct? The da damage claim is still the same. Uh, I would say, I would say generally, Your Honor, I'd have to look at. We do have a, a proposed claim under the Fraudulent Transfer Act. I don't know. Um, I'd have to just double check to see if that provides for any statutory damages or any other damages. Uh, you would be bringing that, not, not to get into the motion yet, but your client is a shareholder, former shareholder. How is he suing on on that act? What's his... Uh, as a creditor, Your Honor. A creditor of who? Uh, a creditor of uh, the company and all of the individual defendants and third-party defendants. All right. So other than that particular damage claim um, and in terms of your breach of contract claim, these other causes of action you, you wanted to, like negligent misrepresentation, fraudulent transfer, fraud, misappropriation. I think there's three of them. I apologize. Let me just read them. Five of them. Fraudulent transfer, intentional fraud, negligent misrepresentation, unjust enrichment, en enrichment, and of course the appointment of a receiver is not relevant to what I'm talking about right now. But there's four of them basically then, correct? Uh, yes, Your Honor. And just looking through the proposed uh, pleading, we we did um, we are demanding punitive damages, so I just want to get that on the record. Uh, punitive are allowed in contract claims, yes or no? I'm sorry, Your Honor, you kind of faded out there for a minute. Apologies. Are you aware of whether punitive are allowed in contract claims? Uh, there are rare exceptions, Your Honor, where um, punitive damages can be awarded in, in a contract claim. And of course, there's all, always the fact that the pleadings have to conform to the evidence. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Yes, Your Honor. So, um, there's two motions. There's a motion to add a cost of claim in the third party and, and uh, that third party defendants, two new individuals. I think one's the wife and daughter of, of uh, Mr. Zolman's client. And uh, you seek to name them as PRPs uh, on these other theories, and also, I guess, on the other contract claims as well. Correct, Mr. Dahan? 
Uh, yes, Your Honor, but they, just to be clear, um, they are already third-party defendants in the case. Okay, you're just seeking to add these other claims. Correct, Your Honor. Right? Right. Yes. So, in the case itself, uh, l let's pretend that I had the ability to understand all of the, uh, and I had in front of me, four years worth of corporate returns and I was able to establish that there's some portion of those funds that the corporation paid were to be uh, were inappropriately paid as part of your claim to show the breach and let's assume it was a hundred dollars David and the corporation doesn't have it but the individuals have it and assuming for the moment that a jury determines that you'd want the hundred dollars back from those individuals, or do you want the corporation to pay it? How does uh, it work? From all, from all defendants and third party defendants jointly and severally, Your Honor. So, in um, assuming arguendo that the uh, line items that you mention in your pleadings potential pleadings and in your certifications. Assuming that there is a, a reasonable determination by a jury that these items are not allowable corporate expenses, and that sounds like an expert, David, um, they're not allowed. And as a, a wasted asset claim, you have a shareholder or a creditor, you think that amount of money should form the nucleus for you being paid a hundred thousand dollars, or at least to have a guarantee, correct? Uh, correct, Your Honor. So that if a jury determined on your contract claim that you're owed a hundred thousand dollars, as you wanted in the main claim, but if a jury determined it was a hundred thousand, and you were seeking to then levy on that amount, by that I mean bank accounts. Uh, homes, all that sort of stuff, you'd be more interested in stopping any transfers or continuing spending of money in a certain amount, correct? Yes, Your Honor, that, that's part. Uh, our relief is twofold, obviously monetary damages, but also to stop the bleeding by having um, uh, eventually a, a, a receiver uh, appointed by the court to take control of the company. Well, you're more interested in getting $100,000, and and I don't know what I didn't say to you. I apologize. I do not know the effect of COVID-19 on this corporation business, so you'll have to explain to me what it does. Go ahead, David. Do you know what the business does, David? Yes, Your, Your Honor. So they, they are in the business of, um, from what I understand, servicing uh, elevators, um, installing them, maintaining them, uh, performing routine maintenance. If a part needs to be replaced, uh, then they'll go out there and, and they'll do it. Um, so that that's my understanding of, of the service uh, they provide, uh, which I would suspect is still a valuable need, um, even dealing with COVID-19. So we'll, we'll do a pretend that uh, they're in some level of business. And uh, I, I don't know, I forgot to look this up. And maybe you know it, David, when's the trial on this? Is there a trial date established on this case? Uh, Your Honor, originally there was uh, a trial. This is very early on in the case. There was a trial date set of April 27 uh, of this year. Um, but what happened subsequent to that was um, we were in court, you know, with Judge Belgard um, on more than one occasion, and I, I believe the court realized that this matter was, um, you know, not was not going to be a simple uh, collection matter, and she reassigned it to track two, um, and entered an order recognizing that um, deadlines would have to get bumped out, including the uh, the trial date. Right. So as we sit here today not getting into your emotion on, on discovery. As we sit here today, do you think paper discovery is completed? No. Have you taken any depositions? 
Uh, Mr. Zolman noticed the deposition of uh, the bank's corporate designee. Um, that did take place. I was there. Mr. Ferguson was there as well. And and uh, what, what was the result of that deposition? Well, Your Honor, from my, from my perspective, uh, we confirmed that the only thing that the defendants, um, and when I say defendants, I really mean Stephen Mangold did, was simply ask the police uh, whether they would be kind enough to uh, remove my client as a guarantor without more. Um, when you and say the other that, thing you mean Fulton Bank? Yes, that Fulton Bank would not release my my client just out of the goodness of their heart. Yeah, they won't do that without having someone else stand in their stead, and they have reassurances that that entity has the economic wherewithal and or money is posted. Well, either that, Your right Honor, now, or... Right now, they settled with you, so that's kind of moot. So... Um, if I go back to the beginning of this, assume it's a $1.6 million a year annual revenues. Have you ever seen any of their corporate returns to establish what the profit is that they're paying the tax on? Uh, I have seen their some of their tax returns, yes, Your Honor. And what, what do they report to the IRS as the profit against which they, they apply the percentage? Uh, your Honor, I don't have those at my fingertips, um, but I can tell you, and this is part of our, our argument, really, whatever they report as a, a net or net profit is irrelevant because um, what's happening here, Your Honor, is this is a textbook example of a family. You know, if you don't have to tell me that, I was going to ask all that. Just bear with me. If you don't have the net profit number, and typically it's about 10%, but I'm okay with with was saying we need that number as you do your calculation for the years in question which is 2017 i think or 2016 2017 2018 what can you determine do you think was paid that should have been paid to people involved in this case well your honor my my client's position is that the defendants and third-party defendants were required to um, offer something to Fulton Bank to have my client removed as guarantor. The settlement That's agreement... That's true, and, and, that, and that they did not do that, and so therefore you're seeking $100,000 today. Plus the attorney... Right. Yes, generally, yes, Your Honor. Yes, 50 plus 50 equals 100, so that... Um, the question I'm grappling with was why get it so complicated when it's a simple matter of having the company put aside a hundred thousand dollars in an escrow fund that no one can touch. Uh, your, your Honor, here, you here, here's 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 the answer. This case was set. This is the second round of a we'll call it a two round fight. Um, there was a prior um, case. Um, that was handled by Judge Baldwin, and that was a case that was initiated by my client for minority oppression and other uh, sort and, and contract claim. Um, and in that case, and this is important to note, Your Honor, Judge Baldwin, there was an application made by my client um, on less than what I presented to the court in connection with these motions. There was an application to have uh, a receiver appointed. Judge Baldwin recognized that and, and approved, granted the motion, appointed a receiver, um, uh, essentially to take over the company. Um, then what happens? There's a settlement that's reached between the parties in the first lawsuit in 2015. Um, Pursuant to that settlement agreement, Your Honor, the defendants and third-party defendants were to use best efforts to get my client um, uh, re released from the guarantee. That clearly involved doing more than just contacting the bank and asking them to remove him. It obviously, right. like Your Honor, involved either uh, coming up with somebody to replace 
Mr. Carswell, as a guarantor, who is financially worthy, for coming up with a lump sum amount to pay the bank to entice them to release my client. Um, they never did that. All they did was call and, and ask the bank, would they release my client? That's clearly not what okay, I, I, um, David, I, I'm going to, uh, for purposes of today, can we just agree that's true? And then get to my point. What I'm trying to ask you, if 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 your if your damage amount is fifty thousand and your attorney's fees are now fifty with a projected attorney fee budget of another fifty, that's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's a lot less than two fifty plus a hundred for three fifty. And the question would be the, the, the to to if you're successful, um, then they have to. You're done. They pay you back the money. Uh, as of today, we sit here talking. The bank's going to give you a release. You're off. Your credit's good. And you just want the money back from uh, Mr. Zolman's client. And then, and you want to make sure the money's there. And all these allegations all relate to the breach of the contract, no question about it. And and I'm not too sure that we need more than that for purposes well, of here. getting the case for trial. That does not mean, let me finish, that does not mean that you're not allowed to explore every aspect of everything you've told me by way of documents, records, depositions, accountants, creating your own world of, of experts, etc. Because if your claim as a former owner is what you're claiming and you're you're at $150,000 once you finally get out of extra attorney's fees unless you can tell me the fraudulent transfer has some trebling or doubling thing going on that's where we are so by adding the extra counts it just makes it more attorney intensive I'd rather get the defendant to pay you the money or to put it aside you understand what I'm saying David Yes, Your Honor, but may I, may I respond to that? Sure. Okay. Your, Your Honor, we've, we've been there, done that. Uh, for the past several months, uh, I have pleaded, pleaded with Mr. Zolman to have his client come up with money. I undertook efforts to have third-party lenders made available for them. Um, and I was told by one third-party lender that if there's equity in his house, that he believed that there was an opportunity to get credit uh, to Mr. Mangold. And they refused to get a, uh, an appraisal done on their house and give it to this credit facility to see if there was equity. They've maintained that they don't have any equity in the house, which is false. Um, they've refused to offer one penny, Your Honor, as a lump sum to get my client released. That forced my client's hand, and he's a hardworking individual. He doesn't have a business like Mr. Mangold. That's that's supplying, that's basically funding uh, his lifestyle. His wife's on the payroll, his daughter's on the payroll, and his son is on the payroll. They buy exotic cars. They go to Wawa. They go to Starbucks. Um, they they take out large cash withdrawals. They take out large ATM withdrawals. They're sucking the money out of this company uh, to, to my client's detriment and to defraud creditors. And that's why, Your Honor, we're at the point where, in my opinion, future efforts to try to get the defendants or third-party uh, uh, defendants to uh, pay my client what he is owed um, and what he has laid out to get released from, from, the, uh, from, from the guarantee is going to be a waste of time because all you're going to hear – is what I've been hearing from Mr. Zolman since I entered this case. And the same thing he's been telling the court in the prior lawsuit and this court and, and this lawsuit. And that is, my client keeps trying. I'm sorry. He's not successful. There's nothing we can do. But here's the bottom line, Your Honor. Throughout the, the years of litigation in the first lawsuit, um, the years that have passed since the settlement was reached in 2015, here we are, 2020, five or six years later. They have not provided one piece of evidence that shows who they apply to, 
where they applied to, when they applied, what documents were supplied to these credit facilities, what were the responses, why wasn't uh, credit given, um, what else needed to be done to, to so, qualify for credit? Nothing, David, Your Honor. David, nothing. David, David, what you're telling me is you're launching again why they breached. You're telling me that that's the liability section. I'm okay with that. I told you I wasn't doubting that for the purposes of today. I told you, well, my concern is you've asked for a lot today. You've asked, I think I, I heard you ask for an amendment and a custodian. And all I was saying was all that's designed to make sure there's $150,000 at the end of the day. And I can order the corporation to, to set aside the money, put it into an interest bearing account, a little of a custodian, a little of new claims. But I just need to know if I'm right that the damage structure is a 50,000 plus 50 maximum right now, not to mention what else you want to do as time goes by. If that's the case, I'm, I'm, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Your motion to add parties, not add parties, add claims, uh, may change the focus of discovery. Uh, but I don't think so. I think you're entitled to all the paper and all and all the electronic data over the past four years from all parties. And if you haven't been provided it, I want to know why. And if Mr. Zolman gave me a certification and they said they don't have it, then in the trial, the fact that they don't have it becomes a credibility thing when you can point out that no, they did have it and here's evidence of it. I, you know, you can't, if people are going to lie on an affidavit, I'm not saying that they're lying, by the way, Mr. Zolman, please. But if they are, he's just a lawyer. Mr. Zolman is just a lawyer. He's talking to a client. The jury will assess whether they're credible or not. So that said, assuming for the moment that I granted your motion, it doesn't change your damage structure. It may change the direction of discovery, but that's about it, David. Well, Your Honor, I, I would, I would, that, that's a fit. Well, I, that's a fair statement. I would just add one little thing to that, Your Honor. Um, the scope of discovery really won't change uh, with the amendment uh, to the to the complaint uh, or to the answer in third party complaint. Um, you know, the, the, the well, facts and circumstances. There is, there is one thing that, David, there is one thing that changes. The allegation, and Mr. Zolman is absolutely correct here, even though you're a good writer and you can analyze well, ultimately, a, an expert's required to analyze the financial reports, the ins and the outs, and come up with the real numbers and a determination as to what is an appropriate charge and what isn't. And then that's your expert, and he has his expert, and then the jury makes the call. So that's why I asked you how much money we're looking at. If we're looking at putting aside $150,000, then I'll, I'll do that. Because then you can go back to your contract claim. And in that contract claim, you can braze on cross-examination all these deficiencies that you believe exist. I mean, it, it's a matter, it's an evidence rule 101 that documents speak for themselves. Their answers you may not know unless you take their depth. But at least, at least you'll be able to take their depth and find out exactly what their answers are and determine whether or not that's a basis for evidence that would allow you to seek additional damages. See what Look, I'm saying, Your Honor, you, David? Yes. Okay. Can I respond? Sure. On, with, with, res, with respect to the expert, Your Honor, I, I would respectfully state that we don't need an expert. And the reason we don't need an expert is because uh, a fact finder, whether it, it's your honor or or jury, can easily analyze and determine whether or not going to Wawa or Starbucks is a legitimate business expense. It's not. I don't need an expert to, to, to say that. Um, you know, I don't need an expert to say that Mr. Mangold should not have taken bonuses, should not have paid himself as handsomely as he did while he knew that my client uh, was out there and he owed an obligation along with the other co-defendants and third-party defendants to use best efforts to have my client removed as guarantor. You know, but that's all, but David, David, this is all goes to liability or damages are not changing. Okay, I'm going to switch gears now. It's quarter after two and I think Deb tells me I have another one. 
I want to talk to, to uh, Mr. Zolman. Mr. Ferguson, you don't have a dog in this fight, right? Uh, the only thing I would say, Your Honor, is if uh, Your Honor is considering putting $150,000 into escrow with the court, my client has a first lien on that cash. Well, that's sort of what I, why I asked you in the beginning. What were you going to be? What are you going to be doing with uh, uh, Mr. Zolman and his client, given the decreased revenues on both sides? I yeah, and un unfortunately, we haven't resolve that so uh yeah i know my client i think I, would, you know, would require me to oppose any order from the court uh putting those funds into court or an escrow account uh based on are you system. opposing the request for a custodian uh my understanding was that they were simply amending their pleadings to add that as a, as a count well, the, I know Mr. DeHaan from other cases will be making the next application to do that. So I'm sure it would be. That, we... I'm sure it would be. And I think uh, if we haven't resolved the case with uh, Mr. Zolman's client by that point, uh, my client would probably have me uh, file an opposition, depending on what uh, is asked for in the motion, of course. So let me ask you about your case. Your case is pretty clean. Uh, in other words, here's the amount of the money that, that was loaned, and here's what we didn't get paid. There's a default, and here's the amount. Why didn't you do a summary judgment motion? Or if you did, what happened to it? Well, I actually prepared a summary judgment motion, Your Honor, and then we got into discovery, and I was, uh, you know, I, I guess there were some issues that were raised by Mr. Zolman's client uh, that, I discussed with my client and uh, we decided that, you know, there, the expense of uh, going forward with the summary judgment motion may be outweighed by some of these issues that Mr. Zolman's client was raising. Um, so we focused our efforts on trying to resolve the case first, um, holding our summary judgment motion kind of in our back pocket if necessary. What I meant was the amount the amount that wasn't paid on evidence rule 101 is clear. The amount of the payments are clear. The amount of damages you seek, whatever the, whatever that says in terms of attorney's fees and the reasonableness is redeemed. So, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Mr. Zolman may have defenses, but this it's part one. So I'm going to talk to Mr. Zolman about a variety of matters. Mr. Zolman, I recognize you oppose the motion to add claims against existing parties. And I recognize that it's based on a variety of factors. Factor number one is he doesn't have an expert. Not too sure he needs one right now, though. I do agree with you that ultimately I think it's an expert case, notwithstanding, notwithstanding David's belief that it's uh, not beyond the keen of ordinary jurors. Um, second. Uh, I, uh, 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 the, the status question intrigued me. I didn't quite, I didn't ask David about that yet, but what I, but I did read in his papers, he suggests that his client is a creditor in the sense that the settlement agreement gives him creditor status. Um, lastly, I think I forget what the third basis that you indicated, but I'll let you challenge a bit, John. I, I, I jumped on everybody else first. Now it's your turn. Go. Well, Your Honor, uh, thank you very much. And, um, you know, the, the, the representations that I made in my papers are, are accurate from our standpoint. Um, and I'm not going to uh, belabor that uh, at risk of uh, causing Mr. Dayhan to become more agitated than perhaps he already is. But, um, Your Honor, this is, this is, in fact, a very simple uh, collection case. This is a line of credit that was in effect for a number of years. This Carswell was a former uh, member or a former shareholder of the L of the uh, of the corporation. This line of credit was maxed out at $250,000 at the time that Mr. Carswell was bought out of his interest in the company. Uh, we did negotiate that. Mr. Carswell had counsel. We did agree as part of that agreement that we would assume responsibility for that outstanding line of credit, which again was maxed out. Um, and we entered into an agreement in that regard to use our best efforts to try to get him off of that loan. In the interim, um, we maintained that loan at, at, as current. We made the payments that were required, and we also made an additional principal payment each and every month. We received an assurance, and I, I say this somewhat um, 
for, from an advocacy standpoint, but, but I, we received an assurance from Fulton Bank that as long as we continue to make payments, um, we were not going to have any issue with this loan being called in. By way of an example, Judge, at the time that uh, Fulton Bank filed this suit, um, I think that they were claiming an amount due and owing of about $192,000, $193,000. That line of credit had been at two hundred fifty at the time we negotiated the buyout from Mr. Carswell. So what that supported was the proposition that Mr. Mangold had continued to make his payments religiously. There had been no default. There had been no issue. And this went on, Your Honor, for a number of years. And when I took the deposition of the Fulton Bank rep, they decided internally that it was time for them to call in this loan. Again, I guess that's their prerogative, but I felt that they were somewhat stopped from doing that based upon the uh, understanding that we had, the agreement that we had. But again, we've continued to, to, do, to, to make the payments. And I would say I said this uh, also, which I think is significant. Even after this lawsuit was filed by Fulton Bank, I instructed Mr. Mangold to continue to make these payments because that's the deal that you entered into with him. And he's continued to do that up until as of Perhaps tomorrow, he'll be making another $2,000 payment, which is the $900 that's going on interest and $1,000 against the principal. I think the amount is down to about $190, $189 before Mr. Cornwell made this $55,000 payment. Now, again, we've been in discussions, Your Honor, trying to resolve this with Fulton Bank. We wanted, more than anything else, to get Mr. Carswell out. Mr. Dahan has been very aggressive and zealous in his advocacy uh, for his client, and we recognize that. It's, it's driving up costs. It's driving up expenses. I, I know what the agreement said. It talks about identification. Once we, we were trying to get money together to get Mr. Carswell allowed, we haven't been able to do that. Mr. Dahan feels that we're not being forthright in trying to do that. We have a different opinion about that, and, and I think the evidence will be to the contrary. But nonetheless, um, now that Mr. Carswell has bought himself out of this, there's no question he owes him that money. That $55,000 went directly against that line of credit, and it's now down to about 140 grand. I had, we've had discussions with, I've had discussions with Fulton Bank. I don't want to go into the details, but that was kind of a condition precedent to us finalizing this with Fulton. And I am very optimistic that very shortly we're going to have an agreement with Fulton Bank, and we're going to have this issue resolved. The only issue that's going to be remaining is going to be Mr. Dayhan's claim on behalf of Mr. Carswell against my client. I, I'm confident that we're going to be able to do this. You asked, you asked, Your Honor, about the status of my client's business. It's been impacted, no question about it. He does two things. He does maintenance of elevators, and he does modernization, which is more like replacements and things like that. His business has been impacted, but he's still working. So he's still in a position to make his payments to Fulton, and I believe we can still enter into the agreement that we have discussed um, that I discussed with Fulton Bank without going into those details. So we're hopeful that that's going to resolve it. Now, going back to the issue, Mr. Dayhan is being, again, 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 I think he's being zealous, and obviously I recognize and I appreciate and I can respect that. It's going over the top, Your Honor. From my position, all he's doing is, is making these claims against my client's wife, against my client's daughter, and he's done that for the sole purpose to force my client to settle out. All of this was done before, he bought, before Mr. Clarkwell bought himself out of the case. So he was doing that in an effort to apply pressure. And I understand that. And I respect it. And I think he even said it in some of his papers. I'm trying to up the ante a little bit, Judge. He said this to Judge Belgard. All these motions, they're intended to up the ante to make them do something because he doesn't feel Mr. Mangold is being forthright and being uh, righteous in trying to get this accomplished. So, listen, we, it's not lost on us. We're trying to do whatever we can. But now that it's accomplished, I, you know, it's funny, Judge. When we were with Judge Belgard last time in open court, I suggested to, to Mr. Dahan, I said, if, if Mr. Um, Carswell is of the position to be able to buy himself out of this. Let's do that. And at least then he's out. We'll stop the bleeding on your side and we'll, 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 we'll move forward. We'll accept responsibility for that. I, that was met with such ire and such upset. But you know, it's funny because that's ended up what happened. Because we learned that through this process of trying to understand who had, who had what and who had what creditworthiness, that Mr. Carswell was actually in a much better financial position than Mr. Mangold. And now he's bought himself out. So now he's out of the case. So I want to cut it off, okay? I know he's got fees. I know he's got a claim for the $55,000. I want to reach a resolution with Fulton Bank. I don't want to continue to propagate this case and make it more. We're talking about more discovery. He's making all these claims against the fraudulent transfers. And again, I think it's, it's overkill now because I think that the purpose of it was to force Mr. Mangle to do something. He still he can't get blood from the stone. <coughs> Mr. Dahan has his arguments about what waste has happened. We, have, we disagree about that, but that's where we are, Judge. I'm just trying to get to the end game of this, but 
Um, I don't know if that answers your question or if I just. No, no, I appreciate that. I have a couple yeah. dumb questions by way of follow up. <laughs> so you agree with me that what I've been said a little while ago is that your damages is limited to at one level fifty five thousand dollars now, and then the second level is some kind of an attorney fee application. Isn't that fair, Mr. Zolman? That's fair, Your Honor. So on the attorney fee, if I was to cut it right now, if I said the case is over, I'm not saying I'm doing this, suggesting it, the case is over, and we would have a redeem application, wouldn't we, by uh, Mr. Uh, by Mr. Uh, Dahan to say, look, this is why why I did it, this is what it's worth, these are my hours, this is the rate in the area, that kind of stuff. Isn't that fair? That That is fair, Your Honor. But my argument okay. would be, my argument would have to be, Your Honor, that my argument will be that Mr. Mangold, despite the allegations, has exercised reasonable efforts to procure the release of Mr. Carswell from the loan. And if he this is possibly a good, good argument. It might not be a zero, by the way, redeemed. It would be 50000 but it's always somewhere in between. That's the way it works. And it's not because uh, judges don't feel like doing it. We know that there's a lot going on here, so... I'd rather settle the case, but I don't want to settle it yet because Mr. Dahan is is upset, I could tell. But I want to have an opportunity to talk to you individually, uh, John and, and uh, Dave. So, that said, uh, I don't know what purpose it sir. Well, let me ask you this. The company, do they have the ability, assuming you settle with uh, Fulton, do you have the ability to set aside some money so that Mr. Dahan feels, feels assured? Any thoughts on that? Uh, my, my thoughts, my, my initial thoughts on that on supporter that he does not have the money to set aside at this time, Judge. But I, I would have to speak to him about it. He hasn't had the money to come up with a lump sum to try to get Mr. Carswell off. I don't think the current events have helped him in any respect, and I know that they probably have hurt him. So with the revenue, I, and that's why I asked, uh, I didn't look at the, the returns, but if the revenue in the firm is, let's say, $1.6 million, six, which is, let's call it 100000 a month. I'm not saying that's the right number. Hundred thousand a month, and how much of that can they give to David's client to make him whole over the space of a year? See, that's how I would look at this. In my simple world, I I inhabit, and that would be something he'd have to look at what David put in his complaint about. Here's some expenses we can do without while we're waiting. You do that in your own life. I do that in my life. Everybody does. Nowadays, I must tell you. I don't know what it's going on anyone else, but everyone I know is talking about cutting back just to make it through the next two months. That said, um, do you have any interest in when do you think you'll resolve this with uh, Doug so I can talk to you today? Um, Your Honor, uh, Doug and I emailed, I guess, maybe yesterday uh, about this, and he was going to speak to Fulton Bank, and I'm sure that they're limited in their ability to look at these things, but. Um, I would hope that we could have an answer shortly, but I'll have to defer to Doug on it. I'm going to do the following. Uh, I'm going to diary this for a week, and I'm going to talk to you and Dave. And Dave you'll, you'll let me know what Doug's doing, obviously. And then I'll talk to you and David about the matter. I'm going to talk to David privately. We're on the record now. So we, right at this point, we have a $100,000 damage claim. At this point, we have... Uh, the request to add parties, not parties, claims, uh, and to continue to continue discovery. Let's talk about discovery before I talk about the claims again. What do you think is left, Mr. Bowman, paper-wise, paper and electronic? Um, I don't think we have a lot from our perspective, Your Honor. Uh, we took the full okay. bank rep. Um, I think we've gotten all the documents that we wanted. We may have done a couple follow-ups or a couple other documents that I think Doug may have produced something recent um, but i think we're okay at that, at that standpoint <clears throat> all right david what do you think you need paper wise don't launch into your motion on on contempt just tell me what you think you need well you, your honor we, we need the you know the responses to the uh outstanding discovery requests um number one um number two uh we, we need to know to whom the defendants and third-party defendants have applied for credit. We need all the applications, all the correspondence, all the documents related to those applications, any denial of credit, any request for further information. 
You know, Mr. Zolman has repeatedly said that they've made reasonable efforts to get financing. I, I've been hearing that for months. No, no, and David, I keep, I keep, David, 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 don't launch. I'm, I, I know, but Your Honor, my client, my client is so frustrated because I, we keep hearing the same, you know, and it's really nonsense that that they no, are. No, no. Dave, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Here's here's what I, I want you to stay focused on. We'll start from the beginning. I don't know if this is true, so I'm just going to lay it out there this way. Number one, I want all paper and electronic discovery that exists as to the corporation, which would include but not be limited to returns, financial statements, uh, and employee and officers list. For, for the years 2016, 2017, and 2018. Second, I want uh, a, uh, any paper or electronic evidence of any applications for credit applications on, on behalf of the of Gold, of the elevator company, and uh, Mr. Mans, whatever his name is, Man, Manfold? What? Mangold, Your Honor. Mangold, excuse me. Okay, I want all that in two weeks if it exists. Or, or John, if John says, I'm sorry, it doesn't exist, you've got to live with that, Dave. I mean, that's Wait, a problem you, in all this discovery. It doesn't exist. No, I, under, I, I, I understand that, Your Honor, but here, here's what troubles me, okay, from a credibility standpoint. M Mr. Zolman's associate represented to, uh, when we were there for a conference, showed Judge Richmond, some correspondents claiming that that supported their argument that they made reasonable efforts to get credit financing. That has never been provided to me, Your Honor. So, yes, am I upset? I'm definitely upset. There's I have no David, 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 that David, relax. I, I'm outlining a, a, a path here. And I forgot where I was. So, the paper, Sean, are you listening? Yes, Judge. Okay, I want you to put uh, the first paragraph is all paper and electronic data from the defendants, including but not limited financial data, including but not limited to tax returns redacted for personal information, financial statements, and other corporate records that would be provided to an accountant. Second. Right, Your Honor, um, yeah. I would indicate that um, they sent a subpoena to our accountant, who's been our accountant for the last 10 years. We did not oppose it because I wanted them to have a picture of the financial situation. Okay, good. So it's, it's all been produced and it's been produced in, in unredacted form. It was all just- uh, Oh, well then you did more than I would have had you do. David, did, did uh, you get all that financial stuff? Uh, we did get we did get documents, financial stuff from the accountant, Your Honor, but not from Mr. Um, Mangold, except for a personal financial statement form that was filled out in December of 2019. And what so years did you want? Your Honor, it should go back uh, just to just to get back on the scope of Your Honor's order, 2015 to the present, because the settlement agreement was entered into in May of 2015. Well, okay, Put it, if they exist, I'll put it there. And this is going to be on our confidentiality order as well because I don't want this on the internet. I don't want this out in some cyberspace stuff. Okay. I want all that to be provided, if we can, by April 17th. David, are you okay with that date? Because I have a reason for this. Yes, Your Honor. Good. Then I want depositions by May 17th. Now, who do you want to depose, David? Well, definitely the accountant, but Your Honor, can we go back to the paper discovery? Because there is more. Well, what are you looking for? I can't imagine what else there well, is. Well, I, I need the tax returns and financial statements from the third party defendants. I, I'm not willing to do that yet. Because the wife is the husband and the daughter. I mean, I'm not, I'm not willing to do that yet. You're going to get the corporate stuff. What else you need? Yeah, but your honor, they're parties to the settlement agreement that Mr. Zolman drafted himself. They're parties to the to the litigation as it stands now. Mr. Zolman. Mr. Zolman, what's your thoughts on, on that data? They shouldn't be parties to this lawsuit, Your Honor. They shouldn't be parties to the case. And that, that information is confidential. It has nothing to do with this with this matter. 
It, they didn't. Uh, they don't have any information about Salton Bank. They didn't guarantee it. They didn't, didn't agree to it. They're, they are they listed in the settlement agreement? They are only because uh, Mr. Fidel had also included them in that prior lawsuit. But they're not signatories to the agreement, and they're 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 they shouldn't be obligated to produce personal financial information. Your Honor, they Your Honor, they benefited from the settlement agreement. They were defendants in the prior case. They're defendants in this case, and they just need, they just need to realize that. And I'll, we'll keep it we'll keep it subject to a confidentiality order. But your honor, I need that to evaluate how my client uh, is going to handle this case moving forward, and uh, with respect to strategy. And they are defended in the case now. So why that wouldn't be uh, subject to discovery? So um, let me just make myself clear. The reason why I mentioned. Mr. Uh, the individual, the man, and the and go and the elevator company, is because there is the elevator company and and uh, the individual is guaranteed the loan himself. He's the one who's on the hook. I know you say the other two are, but the other two are isn't proven to me to be on the hook. And and you have convinced me that they are employees of the corporation. You'll get it all from them. If you do not get the stuff from that, from what we're about to give to you here, then I'm willing to reconsider that, David. Of the wife your, and your, your Honor, can I, just, can, I, can I just make one point? Mr. Zolman is confusing, is misleading the court. The issue is not whether Kathleen Lynn and Sue Ann Mangold were guarantors or were a party to the, the loan agreement. That's not the issue. The issue is they are clearly parties to the settlement agreement uh and even if they weren't parties to the settlement agreement that settlement agreement memorializes their understanding that they were that they did have a duty to use best efforts to have my client removed as guarantor and they failed in that respect my client asserted claims against them they are parties to this lawsuit they're subject to discovery and respectfully your honor we're entitled to that i don't know how i explain to my client how he gave them a release five years ago, okay, with the understanding that they were going to undertake best efforts to have him released. And now we're, we're going to say that they don't even have to produce documents to show whether they had the financial wherewithal to have him released. I mean, I, your, your Honor, that, that's completely fundamentally unfair. I, I thought that we were pretty clear that Mr. Zolman just said to me a little while ago that they did not give you a client get a, get him off the, the loan. I don't understand it, David. He's, no, he's told me that. No, no, your no, no, your honor, your honor. This this is why Mr. What Mr. Zolman says is misleading. Okay, the, his clients, the, the third party defendants, Kathleen Lynn, the daughter of Mr. Mangold, and Sue Ann Mangold, Mr. Mangold's wife, were named defendants in the first lawsuit. They were sued by my client. That first lawsuit resulted in a settlement agreement that was drafted by Mr. Zolman himself. When he drafted right, so it. The, David, David, David. So if liability is not an issue, are you looking for damages? I, 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 I don't quite get it. Just explain it to me. Yeah, so it's two, twofold, Your Honor. Well, I want to see their fight. Protective order, if I may. The motion for protective order is. The, this does not lead to discoverable information because we definitely did not take them off the uh, uh, loan. We couldn't do it as a matter of fact, but we did not do it. Secondly, that whatever damages he has, he has, and, and, and we stand ready to pay for it. If you're worried about their ability to pay, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. If you're worried about whether or not they could have done this a while earlier, uh, then become the evidentiary you believe they had an affirmative duty the woman the two ladies the, the mother and the daughter had an affirmative duty notwithstanding the elevator company and notwithstanding the, the father and husband to provide for alternate financing for the, for for, for the mr uh, your client correct david they had that Absolutely. affirmative in Absolutely, Your Honor. And, and that's what keeps getting lost here. You know, Mr. Zolman has repeatedly said the company has done this, the company has applied for that, but we need to look at the settlement agreement. And the settlement agreement 
clearly applies to all the uh, co-defendants and the third party defendants. If and did, my client, if they took no action to these individuals, then why do you need the the, the, the stuff is what Mr. Zolman says? Because I suspect their next argument is clearly going to be, well, even if we did have a duty, um, we didn't have the financial wherewithal to do it. And I am, my client has the right to explore that defense, whether it's with respect to Mr. Mangold, the company, or the other two individual um, uh, third-party defendants. He should be able to, 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 to prove or get discovery that we, we're confident will show that they had the financial wherewithal to do it. And they just okay, didn't want so to do the wife it. And daughter, the wife and daughter, if they have tax returns, John, and if they have financials, they're to be provided on a confidentiality order for the past three years. And the confidentiality order, order will be in accordance with the uh, suggested form that's on the internet for business cases, which is a pretty strong order. Now, now, David, what else are you looking for paper Um, that's it. Well, your 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 honor, we're we yeah, we have the responses, um, the outstanding responses to this for discovery. That's number one. Um, and uh, we got the coverage of tax returns, financial statements for the others. Um, I do need to know. When, to the extent it's not provided in the document or there's no document, I do need to know when Mr. Um, Mangold presumably or allegedly applied for financing to whom, when, all, all of the details. That has well, not been provided. Will be, David, number one, they got to provide you electronic and paper. And and if, it, if it's not in the electronic and paper, you want him to give you a statement what phone calls he made and what, what door to door he did, what kind of what kind of contacts he made without having a written or electronic evidence. Correct, Your Honor. OK, that's fair. What's the next thing? Um, Your Honor, it's not really paper discovery, but uh, we do we do uh, make an effort. Paper is only. Now, depositions, who do you want to depose? Uh, I want to depose Mr. Mangold, Mr. and Mrs. Mangold. Right. Um, Kathleen Lynn. So we'll call a party uh, in fact deposition by May 17th. Let's make it June 1st. Of one. Your Honor, it, it, and I understand obviously we're all faced with this situation we're in, but it's obviously going to all have to be remote depositions. Absolutely. Uh, ask if, if Mr. Um, Dayham wants to take their depositions, that he provides for the arrangements for that and pay for the cost of doing that remotely. I don't even know whether I'll be in the same room with them at the time. There, these there is a, uh, uh, I do know court reporters have that capability now. Okay. It's I just want to make sure it's going to be more expense. He has to pay for it. Okay. okay. What's the next thing, David? Um, well, Your Honor, you know, obviously that'll be part of our damages, whatever expenses we have to incur to, to prove our claim.